So th this is our um, TGC, is Tintree Global Center. And so when we land on, on uh, Global Center, this is that high level view. Uh, it's not super meaningful, but these numbers are sort of real time what's happening right now uh, across all of the, the various VM stores that are being managed by this. And um, we have lots of material out there that demo uh, Global Center and TGC. So what I wanna focus on specifically uh, in these demos are around those uh, you know, AI enabled portions that um, Erwin has been talking about. And so the first one that I want to show are uh, these pools, which is probably a great segue to that um, the, the question about vMotions and storage vMotion. Uh, so now what we've done here is we've created these pools where we can have a, uh, a number of VM stores. So again, our VM store is our product name. That is a, a piece of hardware. So you hear VM store, think standalone array that is dual controller and fully redundant, right? And um, and in this case, I've got uh, this is our an internal uh, DevOps environment we're running. Unfortunately, the one that I wanted to show recommendations on wasn't set up until earlier today, and the recommendations aren't being generated yet. But that's okay because I do have another that did have some recommendations. When I came in here, this said recommendations it had a little new badge on it, so I it was drawing to my attention that I wanted to do something. And oh, sorry about that. And in here is a sort of a, it's kind of hard to see, is a little history uh, of dates going back in time. And some of them here, uh, like on the 18th, for example, is, is, a, is, a, is a recommendation that was made, but um, this recommendation on the bottom here is no longer valid because it's expired. So if we're not taking actions on these or the recommendations aren't relevant anymore, they expire and we get new ones. So uh, we had received a recommendation today on, on January 20th, and the, the recommendation was um, that it noticed that one of these four VM stores uh, was experiencing high latency this week. And if we look at the details of that, we're seeing that the um, uh, high latency is due to a, an average hit rate of being 54% flash hit rate. Now, this is not relevant to our all flash appliances but it is relevant in the case of hybrids. So we do have some hybrids in our fleet still, uh, especially on the DevOps side where we're still doing QA across all these things uh, and running them. I and we still have a lot deployed out in the field, like a lot deployed out in the field. So um, here is uh, that we're, we're not getting that flash hit rate that we want. And we, we know exactly who the culprits are. And so um, here's a, a range of that hit rate and uh, as a result of that, uh, some of the, the uh, VMs were experiencing two milliseconds of increased latency. So the re recommendation here is pretty simple. It's saying migrate one VM from this particular VM store. So this, um, unfortunately, this is only a one VM recommendation. Uh, it would have been better if this were 20, 50 VMs recommended because uh, I'd have more data to show, but one, one is sufficient. So this particular VM with the name of SC1 etvh um, it wants to migrate it over from this particular VM store to this one. And, uh, and then I could hit, you know, um, that, that's great. I can, I can go ahead and do that if I like to. And then the outcomes are that the space utilization will be increased by uh, like 1.9 terabytes. Um, and the chance of triggering alert is still very low on that uh, destination VM store. The, uh, that destination VM store won't, won't experience any significant change in load. Uh, the, the flash hit rate on that particular one um, will decrease a little bit to an average of 98%, which is, okay, fine. We're, we're, we're in our defined thresholds of what we believe is healthy. Um, and our space utilization, uh, remaining space will, will uh, will be reduced. Um, and so, and then if we want, we can hit execute on this. Off it'll go and it'll trigger this offloaded uh, Tintry uh, migration. So this offloaded migration will take all snapshots and everything associated with this VM, send it over to the other array, directly array to array without any of the impact on the host. Uh, when it does this, uh, we will also move over the policies associated with it, protection policies and stuff, so we won't breach any SLAs in the process. And uh, and then once all that data is kind of moved over, 
we'll do some trickery and then we'll tell vCenter, hey, vCenter, we want you to migrate this particular uh, VM. But when it does it, it's going to be uh, a very quick migration because it's only going to be some deltas because what we'll have done is we'll have uh, put in a VMware level snapshot and it will think that that is all of the data. But meanwhile, that's going to have some pointers off to the other array. We do some trickery in there. But the net result is that for a, a VM that is, you know, two terabytes in size, we, instead of uh, having to wait for 20, 30 minutes, uh, having the host bogged down, having that VM in an unoperational state, unmanageable state, um, we'll do it all in the background. It's still fully manageable. There's no breach in SLA, anything like that. When it comes time for vCenter to do it, it'll take probably a couple minutes. Um, you know, usually it's two, three minutes to just move those deltas from when we were kind of migrating everything over, wrapped it up and had some snaps there. And then it'll, once it's finished, it's on the other array, all the snapshots are there. And once everything is nice and safe, then we can clean it up from where it came from and, and get that space reclamation. So there's all kinds of safeguards in place during this to make sure that if anything goes wrong, that that VM isn't impacted in any way. Um, we've done it so that, um, so, so one of the things so, that- so Rob. Yeah, Yes. So, you know, my question before was, so how often do you see these VM migrations uh, happening in the field? I mean, I mean here's a, a single recommendation, but you, uh, I, I, if you were to have this fully automated version of this, this would have happened without operator intervention at all and it would have, would have occurred? Uh, correct. But so we're seeing that this is taking place. Um, so, so we have a, a vast reporting system that, that feeds back that we have all of the recommendations that had been made and those that had been actioned. And so uh, in order to trigger it, uh, the way that it is in the UI right now is to manually execute. And then, then it's automatic back end. It sends them all over, does it. For uh, some customers who have it fully automated uh, through an API, that is checking these recommendations. If anything exists, just trigger a thing. And then it goes through. And so we're, we're not seeing too many customers that have it, set it, forget it, fully automated. And we've not pushed that to the UI to make that as easy as we want to. That is- Oh, so today I mean, that fully, my, fully automated migration is only available through using the API and, and those sorts of systems. So programmatically available. It's not through the UI. I couldn't set up some flag here. It says correct. fully automate my operations. I want to go to sleep. Correct. When I have this, uh, these properties for the service group here, uh, for these pools, there's no checkbox that says, uh, don't ask me anymore. We It's sort of like the- uh, thresholds of when to do DRS, and we've not checked to the last box in a UI that says that fully automated, you know, do it okay. without ever asking. All right. So you maybe my second I... question Sorry, follow on should be, so how many recommendations are you generating that would be you moving VMs on a, on a, you know, let's say a weekly basis for a typical vSphere environment? So it depends on the environment. Uh, we've Naturally, got and the appliances, no doubt. <laughs> right. So, so we've got different customers that um, some like to keep their systems in and around a 65 to 80 percent utilization load. Right. The more conservative banks and stuff are are loading them up and try and keep themselves that headroom uh, all the time. And then then we've got others that are you know like them at 90, 95 percent utilized so that they're getting full economic value. And only when they really need to buy new piece of hardware, they'll go. So they'll run in the red. Those running in the red will have recommendations probably all of the, or close to all the time if they've got these pools configured. Uh, we've got a number of customers that aren't leveraging these pools. And with the intelligence on the back end and the analysis of what comes back from the auto support, uh, we've done a lot of work this year, in, uh, well, in 2020 in particular, to start analyzing all of that big data into is a very large data lake to now start to um, uh, come up with these uh, machine learned models that are identifying customers that would benefit from having this uh, TGC license, the advanced license that allows for scale out. And then we can proceed with recommending that, hey, you know, you should really use this scale out. And we're implementing that through uh, something we call Advisor inside of Analytics. And after the break, I am going to uh, walk through Advisor in our Analytics products um, so that you can see uh, our, how we 
make these suggestions today and how we are moving that way to have a framework that can give these um, high level recommendations uh, it, that are the help, uh, let me help you kind of recommendations. Cause we, we've got great tools and not too many of our customers aren't using them and too many don't even know they're there. And in some cases, this is the box that no one's had to touch. And we've got all these, you know, we've got a changeover of admins, the admin that takes it over. I don't know, the storage is just on these tin trees. Some of them don't even realize how rich the UI can be on it. And, uh, but they don't need to look at it because it just sits there and runs. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's Thanks. an important uh, point to add, Rob. Like the, 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 in, in some way, if it's an indictment on, on us as a technology company, is that the, 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 the flagship product that we have, the, the VM store array, solves so many of those kind of day-to-day -day operational issues that a lot of customers just take it for granted and they don't necessarily know uh, that there are things like recommendations or, or things like that. And so advisor, again, uh, we'll show you later in this uh, presentation, how we begin to surface some of those insights so they can take advantage of stuff that they already have access to. Um, yeah, so I'll leave it there. Hey guys, I have another question. Uh, I mean, uh, you are showing us uh, a specific optimization for VMware, but uh, you support also uh, uh, KVM and uh, Hyper-V, and they work uh, in a slightly different way. So does it work in the same way? So do you have something that works already in this environment? Uh, um... So for Hyper-V, uh, yes, this works for Hyper-V. The In some ways, Hyper-V has got a bit of an advantage over uh, vSphere because of uh, ODX offload. So the ODX offload already allowed the native uh, uh, live migration, which would be the equivalent of a storage migration, uh, uh, a storage remotion, um, already can do box to box if ODX offload uh, is supported by the uh, hardware. And our VM stores do support that. So when these calls are made, they're already being offloaded for us to move things under the covers uh, before we kind of do that handoff on the host. So not all the bits have to get dragged through the host. But on uh, Zen server, we, we don't have this level of sophistication. So with, with the supported hypervisors we have, um, I'll, I'll just be straight out honest, they're, they're not all supported equally. We've put a, a lot of our effort into the VMware workloads first, given that as uh, the most people to benefit from that. Uh, next would be Hyper-V in terms of... Um, supportability for, for all the features and all the ecosystem plugins and enhancements we have. And we've got uh, Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization and Citrix Zen in there without the same parity as the highest level features that we can do for those others. So guys, I, I have a question as well. And I'm sorry because we are talking very, uh, very high up the stack about telemetry, AI and so on. But my question is very much low level and prosaic. The last exposure I had to Tintree was in 2016. At the time we were using kind of hybrid arrays with SSDs and HDDs. I was looking at some of the slides before you were showing that you are using a RAID uh, kind of uh, mechanism on your backend. And my question is, has anything fundamentally changed since 2016 in terms of your architecture? And what's also, what's up with NVMe? Is that, is that something you're considering at all? Um, if you can tell us a bit more about that, please. Sure. So uh, I'm going to push pause on the NVMe question. I, I think Tomer may be best to field that uh, from, from the VM side of things, um, because we, we do have an NVMe box that's on the horizon. Um, and, and then the other question about has anything fundamentally changed? Uh, and I would say that most of it are small tweaks to the file system. One, uh, some significant um, file system changes that have been done since then are around synchronous replication. Uh, so especially for um, any customer that wants that absolute highest level of availability, they will use synchronous replication. So the data exists on two separate arrays at the same time. And that has gone from a, hey, now it's wrapped up, but you can't do much with it to, hey, now it's wrapped up and we have snapshot support. And uh, last year we completed our vision on SyncREPL with automatic failover. So now when uh, now that uses a, a, third, um, you, a third piece as a witness, that witness can live in the cloud or on site. 
should not live in one of those VM stores that are, are participating in the synchronous replication. And, um, and that fully automates that, uh, that absolute highest level of availability. Yeah, so um, I think the high level question is uh, everything that you're seeing so far, whether or not that represents a significant change, I think broadly speaking, we would say not really. But the point of um, you know the, the presentation that we're making is that uh, these foundational technologies, the fact that we have this telemetry and that we use it already today for these low level optimizations, it means that the data that we get in the cloud is so much uh, richer and the, the, that the, the stuff that we really do apply um, the cloud level analytics that you've seen from other, from other vendors, it means that our source data is so much cleaner uh, and, and those insights are so much richer. I think that's the point. And, and, and that's where we've put a lot of our effort is to move up the stack, take those insights and, and do more with it because um, we fundamentally believe that our, our hardware is, is doing quite, quite well. Um, and it's about leveraging more on aggregates. It's about um, getting these things in these scale out pools and, and pushing that um, automation more that way. So that, that's where we've uh, worked on a lot. And the other big one that we're gonna talk to in, in a lot of detail is the SQL integrated storage. And Sean Myers is gonna go through that in detail. Um, and so that is a, a also a, a big fundamental change for support in our hardware uh, since, since that uh, 2016 field day that you were referring to. But I think what's important again, to kind of recap, especially for folks that have maybe seen this before, um, is the, the idea of the performance reserves and that relationship and that telemetry that we get on the VM stores um, that helps us feed the, those cloud insights that we're going to show later on. So this is a list of the VM stores in the environment. There are 34 being managed by this global center. And these are the number of VMs uh, and managed objects uh, on each. And the reason that we changed the term to managed object instead of saying VM is that once we introduced uh, support for native uh, SQL Server databases, uh, those are not VMs. And DBAs get a little offended when you say, hey, well, your, your VM or database or whatever it is. No, it's, it's not a VM, so let's not call it one. So we've, we've done a bit of an overhaul and we've, we've come up with this term as managed object, as, as Erwin had mentioned earlier. And so there's a, um, a particular VM store that I was looking for in here that had a uh, there's like 224 VMs happen to be on it. It's a, an EC6090 capable of support, supporting far more than this. And if I uh, just drill into this VM store here, to take a look at it, we'll get a, a little overview of the, um, the VM store, like the, the hardware itself, um, what's going on on this box, those top, top 10 VM changers uh, over on the right here, these are ones that are changing their performance reserves. Um, and then we've got our space changers going on here, who's putting on weight, and these over the last seven days. And we've always had this from, from the beginnings, uh, from our, our product GA in 2011. So this, this is not, that stuff's not new. Top 10 contributors is not new. Clicking on a graph and seeing exactly who's done it, also not new. Uh, but what I wanna do is go to one of these graphs that we've had for a long time. Um, which is one, uh, which is the performance reserves itself. And because that is a lot to do with uh, our algorithms on uh, how to decide where, which, which IO to service so that if there's contention, which VM gets, uh, you know, the, which, one, which VMs are not disrupted, which ones might be deemed noisy neighbors, which ones came out of nowhere to do uh, IO that they normally don't do. And, um, and then uh, uh, operate accordingly. So I'm just gonna add a few graphs, but the, the one that I really want up here is this performance reserves. And if I just, oops, I need to give us a, uh, I'll go a one month view, cause this should, should help us um, see if there's any kind of interesting trends. And let me just, okay. Now uh, the thing that is, is stands out to me and give me one sec as my UI just kind of hung for a sec. There we go. So this, this one here uh, it is throughput. And I can see that I've got these spikes that are taking place uh, around 1.32 AM uh, on Saturdays uh, where this particular appliance is being pushed to 3,500 megabytes per second. So three and a half gigabytes 
you know, not gigabit, but gigabytes a second thereabouts. Uh, and what I want to show is the, uh, come on, these performance reserves. Um, and I'm going to just try and narrow in on a smaller timeline instead of the whole month, because specifically what I want to show is that these performance reserves, while they, they go up and down uh, very much correlated to uh, some of that activity, there, if you can see here, here is the activity and we've got some throughput going up to 3200, 3300 megabytes per second at 1.20 a.m. And then we've got latency associated with that. And then our performance reserves are actually changing at like this says 2.20 a.m. So this is, now we've just adjusted to the fact that these ones came out of nowhere, really heavy operations, mostly read, and this latency that, that looks horrific at 430 milliseconds if we were to drill in and see who's getting these latency, this isn't fair across the board. Those that teamed up out of nowhere and just hit it are getting the really heavy latencies up like 700 milliseconds. Now, in the case of this environment and these ones, these are actually virtual arrays that are doing some really heavy operations. And there's hundreds of them that hit at the exact same time. So the first thing I would do is, is, is stagger this so that we don't have our self-inflicted uh, distributed denial of services. But we see this all the time where uh, customers say, hey, at this time, do it and do it for everything we have. And that can hit really hard. So in this case, we have certain ones that are hitting really hard and they're getting uh, extra latency. Now I've got other VMs on here that are oblivious to this. They are driving along. That latency is, is not applied to them. They, their IOs come in and out just like they always did and don't realize what's going on. And that's because they have a certain amount of reserves. Now, the reserves required for these extra VMs to do this have now kind of cut out of the, you know, the extra 50% or so that were, that were on the table and have exceeded that. And so what we've done is we've done a calculation to redistribute to the VMs inside based on their new usage activity that they now have more reserves. And when they have more reserves, they can do more work with less latency. I was I was thinking about uh, uh, VVault and uh, all the other systems that uh, we saw in the last I don't know two three years four years now about analytics and uh, you know performance analysis on the VMs or whatever. So now that we have we have VVaults, yeah, and you know uh, and systems that can go very deep in the even in the in the virtual machine, inside the virtual machine. So start yep. to analyze what the application is doing. So where is the main differentiator of this solution? Sure. Because, so, uh, yep. uh, no, I can see that. I mean, uh, th th there is something that is uh, I'm missing here. Right. So I guess what I'm showing you are the things that we can visually see. So I, I'm using metrics right now. And metrics themselves are a byproduct of the knowledge that we have in the file system. Um, and that that those metrics um, can be derived on other systems, VVALs and, and anything else that has a array level, any aggregator that is reading inside of particular VMs, vCenter itself has a lot of different stats. It, it is not these metrics that are differentiating. It is a file system that is creating a separate queues and servicing the IOs differently per VM. Now, you can have VVALs and you can have the architecture and the promise that the storage subsystem has the ability to separate that out, but they're not doing it. And their file systems are of, of our competitors have not been created to do this. So the, the biggest difference here is that uh, this, this one VM that I was going to show as an example of one that did not feel that latency even with VVALs, unless the storage uh, architecture underneath was written to shield the, the blocks and the IO for other VMs to not be impacted by it, then, then it won't matter. So you'll still see the metrics and stuff, 
but it won't fundamentally be shielded. And the, the biggest difference is have a VM that is nice, stable, steady state, like my desktop, for example, I'm driving along, I'm working, and then I go and I blast uh, power on 300 desktops. Now, assuming that those 300 desktops aren't on the same host as me and rob the host of resources, um, then the storage subsystem, mine will not be feeling it. Now, uh, and the reason is, is because my IOs and everything, the buffers are all set out different. These other systems, these buffers and stuff are not, the IOs coming in and out aren't being allocated at this granularity per the objects to be able to separate them out. All they can do is just sort of serve everything on mass or separate it out into smaller pieces, which are like volumes underneath, but not down to the, the, the granular virtual volume of a V disk like we've done. And and then the, it gone to the top of that, Rob, too, is just, you know, we go from the array shows up in a box at your door, you rack it, stack it, and turn it on, hook up the networking, and vMotion things to it, you're done. Versus vVol setup, you have all those extra steps, all the extra layers, plus the whole metadata process and all the different things with the policies you got to create for vVols that are not A, intuitive, or B, simple, plus you have to manage those long term. Here, you basically, as soon as you vMotion that virtual machine onto this data store, all the things that you can get from vVols are already embedded into this and have been since 2012. So vVols are just trying to catch up, but it's a much more complicated method of doing the same thing. Or uh, doing I think fundamentally, just to add to that is, I think we have a fundamentally different view of the world. I think at Tintree, we believe the infrastructure should be responsible for these things, collecting the telemetry, analyzing the behavior that results from that telemetry, and then making adjustments based on, on inferences that we get from those anal uh, analysis. When we, when we talk about vVols, I think we're, we're, we're at one level, we're, we're acknowledging that traditional storage constructs don't necessarily work for virtual machines, but we're not shifting the responsibility of the decision-making away from the human being. And I think that's a really important part. I think as we continue to kind of show throughout the rest of this presentation, remember this first half of the presentation is really uh, about uh, recapping what we've already brought to market, but the payoff is really in how we take this telemetry We've resolved this day-to-day -day operational burden for our customers in a way that um, we believe that traditional implementations of eVols or, or LUN-based uh, storage constructs can't do. And then that the data that results from all of this intelligent uh, self-optimization provides really valuable source data for real uh, you know, AI in the cloud uh, for understanding things that are much um, broader and, and, and much richer than you know, what is my storage array doing? We're really looking at analytics. And again, the, the, the experience that we want for our customers is turnkey. We don't want them having to go to, you know, dozens of hours of training and implementation and certification and manage services and finding a, a partner to do that kind of stuff. Uh, like Sean mentioned, this is uh, really about, um, you know, the customer buying a VM store in this case, implementing it by themselves without having to know anything about how to implement VM store. Um, and, and gaining the benefit of all these things without having to worry about uh, you know all those day one type operations of configuration and uh, yeah, so Erwin, I think I think we're providing a long a long answer yeah. to Enrico here about vVols and Enrico we we you and I talked about this in one of our previous briefings in the past and we do have a lot of information about vVols we 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 also participated in defining the standard way back uh, but I think the key thing that wasn't mentioned here uh, so far is the fact that vVolts rely on the vendor's implementation, right? And we've seen, you know, different vendors have different implementations with different capabilities. So even if they do implement vVolts, some vendors provide VM level visibility. Other, uh, maybe a small number of them may, maybe can prioritize some VMs over others with tiers, um, but not as granular as, as what we are showing here. And then, of course, what Erwin mentioned, right, it relies on the user to set those quality of service settings, right? The array doesn't decide by itself what needs to be done. And then at the file system level, none of them can uh, prioritize the queuing per VM, right? It's all stream of IO that, uh, that has to be sorted out. And what uh, Rob just showed around the performance reserves, right? This is the array learning the behavior of the workloads across uh, the implementation and then applying those priorities automatically, right? That's the point that I think uh, is, is really critical for this autonomous operations that, that we're, uh, we're talking about. And, and if I can wrap my demo up just to try and uh, drive the point home, if I can. Now, just 
the to recap, we had uh, all these VMs coming out of nowhere, hitting it. Here is a VM that's just been doing its thing. It's pretty stable, steady state. It's it's not really a high I/O demand, right? But these IOs would get lost in that IO blender of on another system had we not known that the IOs intended for the VDISCs of this particular VM have uh, their own lane to go through. And we can see that on it, if I scroll down to the bottom, on the latency, I've got a spike in some host latency. I've got some network latency spikes. Storage latency did not, ex all latency, including storage, is not exceeded two milliseconds. So those VMs and that were, were hitting before were four, 500, 700 milliseconds, right? This one was completely oblivious to that. Um, and the coolest thing is that we didn't do anything to protect this VM. The, the Tintree VM store protected it itself. We didn't tell it this VM exists. The, the, the VM store discovered it because it belongs to a vCenter that's been registered and automatically showed up as a, as a VM. We have all these metrics as byproducts. When I'm, when I'm talking about the ease of use and the benefits of the customers, when it's working right, the customer never goes to the detail I'm going to right now with you. They, they just know that, hey, yeah, these, these VMs, no, no one called, no one said there was any issues. If anyone called and said issues, our metrics will show. Yeah, well, that's why it was it was these ones. And so fundamentally, that's that's the difference here is that nobody really has to do anything to protect the rest. The set it and forget it nature, letting this thing self optimize, um, is is the value. The value is not showing all these metrics. Showing these metrics dilutes the value because we're not the only one with metrics. You can get metrics way beyond what we have uh, with other products as well. It's having these are a byproduct of what we've done fundamentally with the file system. And so what I tried to do in a demo, which maybe I didn't pull it off very well, but I, what I was trying to demonstrate is, is something that was not canned. It was not something that I created. It's a real condition that exists in a real environment, which is our backend DevOps environment that is not managed by me. If it was, we wouldn't see this nasty spike and stuff, to be honest. I would have distributed things a lot differently and I would have taken the scale out recommendations and let things not all exist homogeneously like this on these appliances. But um, with that, I just want to wrap up this, this part I of the demo. Just confirm, um, everything that we've seen here is running on the array. It's not going off to the cloud and being analyzed. It's all running on the array, no additional hardware, et cetera. Uh, technically, kind of mostly, yes. No cloud involvement in what I've shown you so far. All of the uh, adjustments for the I.O. was in the array itself, in, in each piece of hardware. Um, and then there's one more piece, which is this TGC, this Tintry Global Center, is a VM that is running in a, uh, in, in a host that, that are in the customer's environment. So that is where the calculations are done for those, uh, those scale-out pools and the management of it. So technically, the storage for it is living in a Tintry box. Um, but the uh, compute that's running it is four uh, plus CPUs coming out of uh, a VM that the customers deployed out of um, an OVA that we have. And, and then everything that is the cloud intelligence and beyond is not in any product I've shown yet. That will be after the break and I'll clearly show you now we're talking cloud. All of this has been, works exactly like this in a dark site for, for different government agencies and stuff that run Tintry that, that can't use cloud. This all happened, um, you know, on site, on prem, no talking and, and getting advice from anyone anywhere. Is it using any form of intelligence to do the same with hardware degradation over time? Tell, finding that a, a fan starting to spin slower, PSU starting to do different types of behaviors? Yeah, so um, I can answer that several ways. We have auto supports that come out of our VM stores that is. Uh, on by default, it's an opt out, and certainly in the dark sites, those opt out. So for any of the dark sites, they won't get any advantage of that. For most customers, uh, I think it's about two thirds of our customers, they have the auto supports on so that they can get all the benefits of the cloud-based analytics that we're gonna show after the break. And um, in that, it's the auto support. So this is where we see the drive failures. This is where we get the smart readings off the drives. This is where, uh, we can leverage the intelligence of the entire fleet to see uh, certain um, uh, conditions 
happening before they happen to proactively fix things, reach out to customers before it gets bad, uh, patch our firmware as needed to to address certain issues. Things like old issues like wear leveling, we put a lot of consideration into it. Even still, we found a wear leveling problem inside of one of our uh, DOMs, the, the disk on module for the, the, the internal Tintree OS. And we proactively swapped out all those DOMs for all the customers before uh, you know, they had any outages associated with it. And that's just because we had like a, like an event log type of thing hitting the same kind of blocks and not, it wasn't using the Tintree file system in that portion, but that'd be an example of hardware degradation that we're able to catch through our auto supports and uh, protect our customers on. Mm -hmm.